is a very gloomy day today which kind of makes it a perfect day to start my mockingjay reread i am about 60 pages into a mockingjay which is not good because there's now a week before the prequel comes out <laughs> It's fine, it's fine. We'll get through it. We'll do all the things. So as I've mentioned, Mockingjay is my least favorite book in the series. I have a lot of problems with it. Those will more so be discussed near the end section, I guess, of this book though. So for the beginning, we can just be emo. I really like how the book starts off with Katniss in District 12. I realized the movie needed to set up other things, whereas in the book it can just like tell us. But I don't know, I like how this just like dives right in. There's a part where she says, the memories swirl as I try to sort out what is true and what is false. If that's not some foreshadowing on page four. I have a lot of like yellow tabs in the beginning of this, which is important information or like things you remember, blah, blah, blah. Because I kind of forget like just exactly what happened with the bombing like this says more than 90 percent of the district's population is dead the remaining 800 or so are refugees so that just kind of gives you like ideas of like how big 12 was and how much they lost which is a lot and then of course my boy pops up she says the credit for the survivor's escape has landed squarely on gail's shoulders although he's loath to accept it Aww. he's loath to accept it but literally everyone would have died without him it's fine. It was Gail who thought of the meadow, one of the few places not filled with old wooden homes embedded with coal dust. He herded those he could in its direction, including my mother and Prim. He formed the team that pulled down the fence, now just a harmless chain link barrier with the electricity off and led the people into the woods. My mother and Prim had set up a medical area for the injured and were attempting to treat them with whatever they could glean from the woods. Gail had two sets of bows, one hunting knife, one fishing net, and over 800 terrified people to feed. And they left over three days before the rescue came. I just- <laughs> Then we get a little update on Finnick and I'm sad about it because he's just completely in a horrible headspace. He's in the hospital he's sad and she says it takes so much energy to stay angry with someone who cries so much something i didn't expect to really use at all in this book were my tab for funny moments but i've actually used a good handful so far this one is when she finds buttercup and she says thousands of people are dead but he has survived and even looks well fed i just think that's so fucking funny then when they're leaving 12 and they're on the hovercraft and her and gail are talking he says pretty bad down there she says, couldn't be much worse. I look in his eyes and see my own grief reflected there. Our hands find each other, holding fast to a part of 12 that Snow has somehow failed to destroy. How do you not love them? And she's nervous about seeing her family because she doesn't really want to talk about 12 and like what she saw. And Gail says, I doubt they'll ask for details. They saw it burn. They'll mostly be worried about how you're handling it. Gail touches my cheek, like I am. I press my face against his hand for a moment. I'll survive. I won't survive though, consider that. Then we get that video message thing, PETA being in the Capitol interviewed by Caesar Flickerman, which again, I think the book did it so much better. Like PETA came across much better in the book, but that's just, that's just a true fact that movie Peter, Peter. <laughs> Maybe that's what we should call him, Peter. I put a quote tab on this because I really liked it. They're talking about being in the arena and Caesar says, it costs your life. And Peter says, oh no, it costs a lot more than your life. To murder innocent people, it costs everything you are. I even wrote in the margins like this interview much, much, much better <laughs> than the movie one. So obviously he talks about like a ceasefire and people are angry, which I think is appropriate regardless of his reason for saying it. Like that does like put a sting in the rebellion, it kind of does it help. But the thing is, I I honestly don't remember the movie that much because the Mockingjay movies are the ones I have watched the least for sure, especially part one. But like, I'm pretty sure in the movie, like Gail is just super angry, which not saying that he wouldn't have a right to be, but like, it's not the same as he is in the book. And they even give, I think, one of his lines about Peta protecting her to Prim, which just pissed me the fuck off. And like, the movie does not give me like one of my favorite scenes that is in this book, which is this one. Katniss was like, gotta get out of here. Got a blast. After watching the thing with Peta and Coin's men try to stop her, but Gail like gets in front of him and he ends up getting punched in the nose and stuff. But like, he makes it so that Katniss can get away. And then he eventually joins her in a storage closet. So the storage closet scene, ugh. I just love this whole interaction between them, but I won't read all of it out loud to you. This part though, you fought with Boggs? No, just blocked the doorway when he tried to follow you. His elbow caught me in the nose. They'll probably punish you. 
I already have. He holds up his wrist. I stare at it uncomprehendingly. Coin took back my communa cuff. I bite my lip, trying to remain serious, but it seems so ridiculous. I'm sorry, soldier Gail Hawthorne. Don't be, soldier Katniss Everdeen, he grins. I felt like a jerk walking around with it anyway. We both start laughing. I think it was quite a demotion. This is one of the few good things about 13, getting Gail back. And then see, Gail doesn't just like get like pissed off, whatever. This is what he says about PETA's declaration for a ceasefire. It says, Gail's expression darkens. PETA might have done a lot of damage tonight. Most of the rebels will dismiss what he said immediately, of course, but there are districts where the resistance is shakier. The ceasefire is clearly President Snow's idea, but it seems so reasonable coming out of Peta's mouth. Cause my boy is smart, like... And Katniss says, I'm afraid of Gail's answer, but I ask anyway, why do you think he said it? He might have been tortured or persuaded. My guess is he made some kind of deal to protect you. He put forth the idea of the ceasefire if Snow let him present you as a confused pregnant girl who had no idea what was going on when she was taken prisoner by the rebels. This way, if the districts lose, there's still a chance of leniency for you, if you play it right. I must still look perplexed because Gail delivers the next line very slowly. Katniss. He's still trying to keep you alive. And next to that, I wrote, fuck the movie. And then we basically get Katniss just really considering this rebellion for the first time and her getting angry and being like, fuck it, I'll be their Mockingjay. There's this scene of the two of them at lunch. Katniss had like already shoveled down her food. As you know, in District 13, like portions are really strict. Otherwise they wouldn't have kept their people alive. It says, Gail sets his tray beside me and I try not to stare at his turnips too pathetically because I really want more. And he's already too quick to slip me his food. Even though I turn my attention to neat folding my napkin a spoonful of turnips slops into my bowl <laughs> the true king keeping his woman fed and they're talking about conditions that she should have to be the mockingjay she says hey maybe i should make that a condition of being the mockingjay and he says that i can feed you turnips because <laughs> you're technically not supposed to share food and she says no that we can hunt this gets his attention we'd have to give everything to the kitchen but still we could i don't have to finish because he knows we could be above ground out in the woods we could be ourselves again so she goes into the room and she's like writing down everything she wants. Buttercup, hunting, Peta's immunity. And then she's thinking to herself and says, this is it, probably my only chance to bargain. Think, what else do you want? I feel him standing at my shoulder. Gail, I add to the list. I don't think I can do this without him. And I am wrong for shipping this. I'm wrong? Okay, okay. Then when she's talking to Coin, she says, yeah, so this is the deal. I'll be your Mockingjay. Something about it just, really showed that like yes Katniss is a teenager just this I don't know it I think it reads better but something about it, it was just like a nice reminder because sometimes Katniss can obviously seem much older than she is because of everything that she's gone through and she's telling them all of her demands conditions whatever you want to call them she says Gail I'll need him with me to do this and Quinn says with you how off camera by your side at all times do you want him presented as your new lover and you know Katniss is just in there like the fuck? And we get this quote, which I, as much as a Gail Katniss shipper I am, I still really like this. She says, the very notion that I'm devoting any thought to who I want presented as my lover, given our current circumstances, is demeaning. You tell her, sister. And then they're showing Katniss the book of designs that Cinna did, like rebel outfit designs. And Plutarch says, yes, he made me promise not to show you this book until you decided to be the Mockingjay on your own. I just love that. Like, Cinna is that man. And they're going down to the very like bottom of District 13. Not to Katniss's knowledge, but to pick up her prep team. But they're kind of being like shooed away, whatever. My eyes meet Gail's for just a moment, but it's long enough for two people who operate the way we do. And then basically their movements make it so Katniss can get around the guards and see that her prep team is all shackled. But for two people who operate the way we do, they just know each other. Then we get a scene of Katniss and Gail hunting and we get one of my favorite quotes in the whole series. We hunt like in the old days, silent, needing no words to communicate because here in the woods we move as two parts of one being we move as two parts of one being how have y'all read these words and not been like oh they do have a little moment of tension here where gail's like why are you so concerned with your prep team and katniss is like why wouldn't i be and this is another part where i think both of their sides are valid because Katniss, she did get to know her prep team. Whereas Gail, they're just people in the capital who have been complacent in the Hunger Games, watching kids die every single year. And so I think a big question that this book brings is like, are the capital people 
innocent when they had just grown up with the games, when it's the only thing they knew? Or should they have spoken about this? Tried to kind of like do their own kind of upraising or like, you know, something like that. And I think that question can relate to a lot of real life things when it comes to like racism and homophobia and all this shit. It's like, you might have been raised a certain way, but do you get a pass because of that, you know? I don't know. I think it's a lot to think about and I don't think people take the nuance of it enough. Is that the right word? I don't know. I think people are just too, too a little. I don't think people quite understand why someone like Gail would be so angry with the Capitol. I don't think people are thinking like that just because we get Katniss's view who has seen a few good people from the Capitol or has seen some dumb people with good intentions or not with bad intentions. But at the same time, they let the games go on. So like, what do you say? What do you say to that? And then that is basically caught up. Coin makes the announcement that the victors that are captured will be immune unless Katniss fucks up and then it doesn't matter. So Katniss is like, great. I can't believe I just talked for nearly 20 damn minutes about the first 60 pages of this book. Jesus, take the camera. I'm going to try to keep this clip short because the last time I talked for 20 minutes about 60 pages and this time I've read like over 100. <laughs> I hate this camera angle. So we get to see a little more of Gail's family which I love. His sister Posey tells Octavia that her skin would be pretty no matter what color and it's just so sweet. Still salty that his family was not in the movie. We'll never not be salty. Also BT at some point says the line, if you knew what Finnick's been through the last few years, you'd know how remarkable it is. He's still with us at all. And that made me want to rip my hair out and cry. Katniss and Gail are looking at the new weapons that were designed for them and Gail's like, playing around with it and Katniss is like, so it'd be easy for you using that on people? And Gail says, I didn't say that, but if I had a weapon that could have stopped what I saw happen in 12, if I'd had a weapon that could have kept you out of the arena, I'd have used it. And I think that's just really sums up who Gail is. Like he's not trying to be this like super violent, whatever kind of person. He's just trying to stand up for the people that he loves and the people that have been oppressed for over 75 goddamn years. But many of you don't seem to understand that. Another thing the movie didn't do is give us the why do you find this distracting scene with Finnick when he like takes off his hospital gown and he's only in his underwear. I think one time they said they, they didn't do it because like it was too like humorous in a very serious movie but like we could have a little humor. It's sad. One of the Capitol rebels is like not everyone is born with a camera ready face. Like him. She snags Gale who's in conversation with Plutarch and spins him towards us. Isn't he handsome? I can't believe Suzanne Collins wrote me into this book. Something else I really appreciate from this series is kind of like the social commentary. This line in particular got me because they're talking about how the world will be run if they win this rebellion and they're talking about like you know what we have. Plutarch says and if our ancestors could do it then we can too and Katniss in her monologues. Frankly our ancestors don't seem much to brag about. I mean look at the state they left us in with the wars and the broken planet. Clearly they didn't care about what would happen to the people who came after them. That's us y'all. That's us. Then we get the scene of Katniss going to District 8. We get this great Gail Katniss line where she says my fingers wrap around Gail's wrist. Do not leave my side I say under my breath. I'm right here. He answers quietly. Also, I just love seeing how the wounded like react to Katniss. Like the girl's like, oh my God, you're here. I have to tell my brother. And it's just like, that's my girl. She's inspiring a whole country. And the bombing starts happening in eight. And I think again, this is where you see Gail's real character is both him and Katniss. They don't hesitate to fight along with the rebels in eight to try to stop the bombing, even though the whole team of District 13 people are like, we gotta protect you and keep you safe. And also Gail and Katniss fighting side by side, like their chemistry and the way they just know. Ugh. I'm just saying Katniss and Peta could never. Then I had a revelation, a whole revelation. This kind of is more talk for the end of the book, but I, I'll probably forget, so I'm gonna say it now. As we know, Prim dies in the end. And the number one thing people who don't like Gail say is, Gail killed Prim, which is wrong and dumb and I will get to all the reasons why. But Katniss is kind of like wondering why the Capitol would kill people who are already like wounded and stuff and Gail's like giving her the answer basically. And she says, I remember all those years in the woods listening to Gail rant against the Capitol. Me, not paying close attention, wondering why he even bothered to dissect its motives, why thinking like our enemy would ever matter. 
Clearly, it could have mattered today. When Gale questioned the existence of the hospital, he was not thinking of disease, but this, because he never underestimates the cruelty of those we face. And that is exactly why he creates the weapon that he creates. I don't even know if he makes, he doesn't like make it himself, I'm pretty sure BT does. He just has the idea of it because he's like, this is something that the Capitol would do. And if we're going to beat the Capitol, we have to think like them, which is just common sense, but everyone wants to villainize him for it. And I think one of the points, one of the things he got wrong is he wasn't realizing in the way that I think Katniss was, that Coin was also an enemy because Coin is the one who uses the weapon even when they didn't need to. Coin is the one responsible for Prim's death. Get that fucking straight. So yeah, I just had a big like revelation. I was like, wow understanding my boy even more than I already did. Gail and Katniss do get into like a few like arguments in this book, which I think is natural because they're literally going through a war, but that's another reason people are like, oh, I hate Gail because he, I don't know, stands up for himself and has an opinion, which Katniss is like, it's one of the reasons I trust him because you can't sway him. You can't just change his opinion. Anyway, she gets upset with him because he doesn't tell her about the interview with PETA. And I see both of their sides in this. I see Katniss not wanting to be lied to. And I see Gail not wanting to tell her because they know it'll upset her. But then they go to 12 for a little filming thing. And they're walking around their old hunting place. Katniss says, it's our old hunting rendezvous place. She wants to see it even after we tell her it's nothing really. Nothing but a place where I was happy, I think. Nothing but a place where she was happy. And then I just love this little paragraph. It says, Our rock ledge overlooking the valley, perhaps a little less green than usual, but the blackberry bushes hang heavy with fruit. Here began countless days of hunting and snaring, fishing and gathering, roaming together through the woods, unloading our thoughts while we fill our game bags. This was the doorway to both sustenance and sanity, and we were each other's key. Sustenance and sanity, and we were each other's key. <laughs> I'm telling y'all, I'm telling y'all, stop booing me, I'm right. Also, Gail pulls off his shirt to show Cressida his scars and I don't wanna talk about it. They've kind of made up at this point and he goes and sees her in her house and he's like, this is where you kissed me. And she was like, ha ha, thought you wouldn't remember that. And Gail says, have to be dead to forget. Maybe not even then. Maybe I'll be like that man in the hanging tree, still waiting for an answer. Fuck me the fuck up. Gail, who I've never seen cry, has tears in his eyes. To keep them from spilling over, I reach forward and press my lips against his. We taste of heat, ashes, and misery. It's a surprising flavor for such a gentle kiss. He pulls away first and gives me a wry smile. I knew you'd kiss me. How, I say, because I didn't know myself. Because I'm in pain. That's the only way I get your attention. Don't worry, Katniss. It'll pass. It hasn't passed for me. When is it gonna pass for me? Then we get the scene of PETA warning District 13 that they were gonna be bombed. And this is definitely one of the like, kind of like, gut-wrenching scenes just because it's like written so well they're like putting rebel clips alongside the capitol's own broadcast and it says but between the images we are privy to the real life action being played out on the set PETA's attempt to continue speaking the camera knocked down to record the white tiled floor the scuffle of boots the impact of the blow that's inseparable from PETA's cry of pain and his blood as it splatters the tiles like that imagery is just so divine so well written and it just it's rough I'm not a PETA stan, but it's still rough. Katniss is talking about some of the other drills that they've had in comparison to the alarm that's going off now. It says, a level two drill meant for minor crises, such as a temporary quarantine while citizens were tested for contagion during a flu outbreak. That's the last thing I needed to read right now. Truly. So then after the bombing, Katniss is trying to film a little propaganda message, just being like, we're here, we survived. And she's like basically having a panic attack because she has realized that her being the Mockingjay is kind of hurting PETA. Like that's what President Snow's game is. And this is probably the best moment between Haymitch and Katniss. She starts crying and she says, several sets of arms would embrace me. But in the end, the only person I truly want to comfort me is Haymitch because he loves PETA too. I reach out for him and say something like his name and he's there holding me and patting my back. It's okay. It'll be okay, sweetheart. He sits me on a length of broken marble pillar and keeps an arm around me while I sob. I can't do this anymore, I say. I know, he says. I just think that was really sweet and we don't really get many sweet Hamish moments, so. And then, because they had knocked her out and Hamish goes and sees her later, they're like, okay, they're, they sent a rescue team. It's fine. It was all volunteer. I tried to volunteer, but they ignored me. Katniss is like, okay, so like, who else volunteered? And Hamish is like, oh, there's like seven people, it's like chill. And she's like, so who? And Hamish is just finally like, 
bitch you know who you know who you know who stepped up first And then we get Finnick telling his story of being sold and it literally makes me sick every time I read it. Suzanne Collins couldn't give him any happiness. Everyone's rescued. Peter comes back. He chokes her. It's chill. And that's where I left off. Okay, got through that quick compared to the last time. <laughs> I have to say I'm really enjoying Mockingjay so far. Like I told you I have problems with this book. And so it's made me realize that those problems come up at the end since I really haven't like had anything that I've hated, but we still have a lot of book to go. Look at me actually putting on makeup and brushing out my hair. Ugh. So last night I read about another 100 pages or so, I would say, of Mockingjay. Something I really like is we get to see Prim have a bit of a backbone and just more of a personality. After Katniss is choked and she can't talk, Prim is there. It says Plutarch ushers the doctors out and tries to order Prim to go as well. But she says, no, if you force me to leave, I'll go directly to surgery and tell my mother everything that's happened. And I warn you, she doesn't think much of a game maker calling the shots on Katniss's life, especially when you've taken such poor care of her. Like, okay, Prim, I see you, sweetie. And then because I'm an emo Gail stan, of course, I put a tab on this. Katniss is in the hospital and Gail was too because, you know, he volunteered. Gail's not supposed to visit me as he's confined to bed with some kind of shoulder wound. But on the third night, after I've been medicated and the lights turned down low for bedtime, he slipped silently into my room. He doesn't speak, just runs his fingers over the bruises on my neck with a touch as light as moth wings, plants a kiss between my eyes, and disappears. A touch as light as moth wings. I can't say that. I tried a million times. Oh my god. Then we get to another, like, controversial part of the character of Gail Hawthorne. She's going down to weapons where Gail and BT are, like, working on different schemes, different kind of, like, snares, but for humans sort of thing. We learn about the one that will ultimately be the design that kills Prim. But he didn't launch it. We're gonna get into it. We're gonna get into it. Katniss says that seems to be crossing some kind of line. So anything goes. I guess there isn't a rule book for what might be unacceptable to do to another human being. And Gail makes a very good point when he says, sure there is. BT and I have been following the same rule book President Snow used when he hijacked PETA. Like they aren't gonna beat the Capitol by playing fair because the Capitol is not playing fair. I'm just saying. And then we're in district two and Katniss and Gail are like kissing. Katniss is like, I'm just lonely and I need a distraction. So you know what, why not? And Gail, always the smart king that he is, picks up on this. He says, what's going on in your head? She says, I don't know. And it's like kissing someone who's drunk. It doesn't count. And she's like, how do you know? Have you kissed someone drunk? And he's like, no, but it's not hard to imagine. And this is the part I specifically underlined. So you never kissed any other girls? I didn't say that. You know, you were only 12 when we met and a real pain besides. And then he's talking about all the girls he's kissed in different places. And I'm like, I would like to sign up. And here, here is just, <sighs> Suzanne, I do thank you for this. Another thing people always love to say about Gail is that he only cared about Katniss, about being with her in like a relationship when she was sent to the Capitol and had PETA presented as her lover. But the text addresses that literally right here, page 199 of the hardcover of Mockingjay. Katniss says, so when did I become so special? When they carted me off to the Capitol? No, about six months before that, right after New Year's. We were in the hob, eating some slop of greasy says, and Darius was teasing you about trading a rabbit for one of his kisses. And I realized I minded. <laughs> oh my God. And there's the other part of District 2, and this is the one part where I will say that Gail acted a little too angry, a little too harsh, which is when he comes up with the idea of how to take over the nut in District 2, which is like the big mountain where all like the peacekeepers and shit are, and basically a big part of the capital's defense. And his idea is to just have an avalanche, and he would love if there was like no survivors. He's like, I don't care. And that's the part where I think it was like a little too angry. Like, I've never said Gail is perfect. Perfect. But do I also see his reasoning? Yes, because again, it's in the text. Someone says they should at least have a chance to surrender. And Gail says, well, that's a luxury we weren't given when they firebombed 12. We watched children burn to death and there was nothing we could do. So his anger is not out of nowhere. It comes from the fact that District 2 are the ones who bombed 12. And then Katniss says to him, you don't know how those District 2 people ended up in the nut. They may have been coerced. They may be held against their will. Some are our own spies. Will you kill them too? And Gail says, I would sacrifice 
a few, yes, to take out the rest of them. And if I were a spy in there, I'd say bring on the avalanches. I know he's telling the truth, that Gale would sacrifice his life in this way for the cause. No one doubts it. So he's just very extreme about the cause. He would lay down his life easily. I wouldn't say that turns him, I can't think of the word for it, but like when you're like off the deep end. He's just hurt and I think the more this rebellion goes on, the more he's like getting amped up, you know? I don't know, makes sense to me, but y'all, y'all think what you want. But I can also see Katniss' side of it, whereas she's seen so much death and how the mountain reminds her too much of the mines and all that. It makes her think of her father. So like I said, I think the point that Suzanne Collins was trying to make with this book is that there are multiple sides in a war. There's different point of views and neither of them are technically wrong and obviously this is like a situation that you can't necessarily compare this book the war in this book to wars that we have obviously there are going to be some similarities but they're fighting against a government that is way worse than ours and so it makes sense that extremities would occur and i think that's continued to be shown when katniss is giving her speech in district two about how they need to come together they're all just being pieces in the capital in snow's games but still at the end she gets shot so then we have a fun scene because joanna and katniss start rooming together in the hospital gail comes to visit them and joanna's like your cousin's not afraid of me she scoots off my bed and crosses to the door nudging gail's leg with her hip as she passes him are you gorgeous and then he mouths to katniss terrified i specifically remember i made like an edit of that on tumblr because that's who i was anyway then they go back to 12 to katniss's house because minnick and annie are getting married and they want a nice wedding dress and this was just so funny i had to talk about it octavia one of katniss's prep team members is there and she says it's been so long since i've seen anything pretty and she's like crying as she like holds this fabric i tend to have forgotten that like there are funny parts of this book that it isn't just all bleak bleak sad sad and then we get that scene where katniss goes to visit peter for the first time they're both kind of hostile with each other this is one part where i wanted something that was in the movie that wasn't in the book it's when he's like talking about giving her the bread and he says a line that's something like i should have gave it to the pig and i found it so funny but that's not actually in the book i marked these pages for multiple reasons i feel like people think katniss is over gail in mockingjay especially like at this point but here she's been told that she can't go to the capital she's not a soldier and when coin asks like why she has to go she's going over reasons in her head and she says or that the idea of remaining here in 13 with the latest version of Peta while gail goes off to fight is unbearable so at that point i feel like they're both very equally in her heart and i feel like they always are even after the end of the book but we'll get to that but then we get a lot of just funny moments between joanna and katniss joanna says fine i'll train but i'm going to the stinking capital if i have to kill a crew and fly there myself katniss says probably best not to bring that up in training but it's nice to know i'll have a ride and we also get really sweet moments between katniss and joanna like when she wants to get out of the hospital so she wouldn't be looked at like a patient but they won't let her room alone so katniss is like i'll room with her i just really liked this little exchange joanna says you're not afraid i'll kill you tonight and then katniss says like i couldn't take you then we laugh since both our bodies are so wrecked it will be a miracle if we can get up the next day that's just so cute katniss having a female friend it's what she deserves so then there's the lunchroom scene where they're just all eating and then Peter shows up and it's like oh first of all fiddick holding both his and annie's tray in one hand and holding her with the other is absolute king shit where is my man and then Peter says you be nice to her Finnick or I might try and take her away from you it could be a joke if the tone wasn't so cold everything it conveys is wrong the open distrust of Finnick the implication that Peter has his eye on Annie that Annie could desert Finnick that I do not even exist and then Finnick says like again the absolute king he is so Peter says Finnick lightly don't make me sorry I restarted your heart <laughs> And then Katniss is feeling like emo because she's like, I think Peter doesn't like me because he sees me for what I really am. And Gail says, Katniss, as your oldest friend, believe me when I say he's not seeing you as you really are. So then we get Katniss taking her exam to see if she can become a soldier. And she passes. And I just underlined this because it was just so cute. Like such like a little reminder that Katniss is like a teenager and she's just, she's just a girl. Like she says, I'm not only in, I get to work under Boggs with my friends. I force myself to take calm soldierly steps to join them instead of jumping up and down. 
baby. Also, like I said, didn't expect to find funny moments like all the way here at this part of the book. But Hamish says he wants as many victors as possible for the cameras to follow in the capital. Thinks it makes better for television. Are you and BT going? As many young and attractive victors as possible. Hamish corrects himself. And then we have another sweet Joanna Katniss moment. She went out and got a bundle of things to make it smell like the pine trees and she gives it to her. And Joanna's like, it smells like home. And then something that like just fucked me up. Joanna says, you have to kill him Katniss. Don't worry, swear on it. On something you care about. I swear it. On my life. On your family's life, she insists. On my family's life, I repeat. And she doesn't kill Snow. Let's just let that sink in. Wow. Another really funny moment is they are finding out that they're gonna be the star squad and Gail and Finnick are like, so we're not actually fighting? This is bullshit. And Plutarch's like, Katniss had such an effect being on screen. Do you notice how she's the only one not complaining? It's because she understands the power of the screen. And then internally Katniss says, actually Katniss isn't complaining because she has no intentions of staying with the Star Squad, but she recognizes the necessity of getting to the Capitol before carrying out any plan. My bitch, I love her. Reading this book, there are just so many freaking foreshadowing like hints that Prim is gonna die. Her and Katniss are talking and Prim says, how do you feel? Better, knowing you're somewhere Snow can't reach you. And Prim says, next time we see each other, we'll be free of him. And then one last little funny moment, which I think might truly be one of the last funny moments. They're talking about how they're like shooting at random things and sometimes they like actually need it to be for something real and like intense and accurate, whatever. Eight hands go up, but Gail, Finnick, and I are never chosen. Katniss says, it's your own fault for being so camera ready. I tell Gail, if looks could kill my babies. And then Peta arrives as part of the star squad and that's where I left off, part three. The Assassin. Honestly, this book has really gone better than I thought, but I think it's this part, part three, that is gonna strike some nerves in me. We'll see. It's It's been so long. It's been fun so far. It's been fun so far. I don't think I have to tell you what part I'm at. <laughs> Just know that I am not okay. <laughs> I'm so worried. But then I just had to go and underline the sad part and now I just read it again so it's just it <laughs> It's just so funny to me how pages 312 and 313 of the Mockingjay hardback don't exist. Like, it's just so funny. I forgot I was wearing makeup. <laughs> Is this a look? Me showing up to the Finnick O'Dare funeral. Two hours later. <laughs> He's older than his shoe in his dream. not having a good time. All right, friends, I am here with my final Mockingjay update. I finished the book last night. I don't even know how many times I've read this, but the fact that it still just absolutely guts me. Suzanne did that, I guess. I have to say, I think I liked this more this time around. I don't know if it was because I was analyzing everything and really highlighting and tabbing and paying attention to all my little thoughts. I think I have this at like a three stars on Goodreads right now, but I'd probably give it a four this time around. Honestly, I have flipped on my star rating so many times on this book that that doesn't even really matter. Okay, so let's, let's get into the final things that I want to talk about. So part three, Peter shows up, Coin sends him, Katniss and the whole team are like, what the fuck? We get this quote from Boggs that gets me really emo. They're talking about how Coin basically wants Katniss to die and Boggs says, but that's not going to happen under my watch. Soldier Everdeen. I'm planning for you to have a long life. Why? This kind of thinking will only bring him trouble. You don't owe me anything because you've earned it. But there's also a conversation to be had in that and does anyone really need to earn their long life? I don't know, but it still made me emo. Then we get to a part I didn't like, which is Katniss is like on the phone with Haymitch and Haymitch is like, you're being bad to Peta. Would he be treating you this way if the situation was flipped? And I think it's fine to tell her that she needs to like chill a little bit with her anger because it isn't Peta's fault that he's acting the way he is. But once again, we get the dynamic of like, Peta is so much better and I hate it. I just hate it. Suzanne Collins has a way of writing character deaths that really just gut you. Still facing us as his left foot steps back onto the orange paving stone, triggering the bomb that blows off his legs. Bogs. I feel like he was definitely written as a white man, just the way that he's described. But the fact that the movie got Mahershala Ali to play him, fucking blessed. 
So then they're all figuring out what to do and Katniss is like, I have a secret mission, even though she doesn't. Gail says, we have to go. I'm following Katniss. If you don't want to, head back to camp, but let's move. And there's just so many little moments in this book where Gail is like, I'm following Katniss, I'm not leaving her, I'm going with you, and it just makes me emo every single time because at this point, you know why, you know who I am. Then they're in a capital apartment and they're finding like the little places that they have stored food and stuff. The hoarding discussed the soldiers race in 13. Isn't this illegal? Says League One. On the contrary, in the capital you'd be considered stupid not to do it, says Masala. Even before the quarter quell, people were starting to stock up on scarce supplies while others went without, says League One. Right, says Masala. That's how it works here. And I was just like, life imitates art because if that's not 2020 and like the toilet paper situation and now the meat situation, then they're underground in the tunnels. There's this one quote, it's one of the big, I would say, Katniss and Peta quotes that I really like, actually. Peta says, you're still trying to protect me, real or not real. Real, I answer. It seems to require more explanation because that's what you and I do, protect each other. And then the chapter ends with just the mutts hissing Katniss and I just wrote, no, 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 no. Because like, no. Y'all know what fucking happens in the tunnels. Again, Suzanne Collins just has a way with death scenes. I'm not gonna read it out loud because it hurts too much, but you know the quote. Finnick is like the one character that I literally ignore his canon. Like I, in my head, this did not happen. He does not die. Like, he is live, living his life. Then we get the part where they come upon a capital citizen and Katniss, like, shoots the woman without hesitating. And I underlined that and I said, something intelligent about war here. I still don't exactly have the intelligent thought, but I don't know. I just think it's one of those things that, like, this book tries to portray is that war is deadly and war is hard and I don't know. I don't know what to say. People die and it sucks. Which is why we shouldn't have war, but you can't say that war was not necessary in this book because their government, yickety yikes. So Katniss is tallying the dead of her squad and she says eight dead in 24 hours. And that's the same number of dead victors in the bloodbath for catching fire. And before they went to the capital in this book, Finnick and Katniss kind of like joke, like welcome to the 76 Hunger Games. And I don't know if Suzanne did that on purpose, but it made me think like it's, it's connected somehow it's in there they're in tigress's shop then and tigress says no one knows what to do with you girly and this quote is actually used in like a later section of this book by katniss herself and i just thought that was interesting and i really like that line because it's true. Then we have one of my favorite parts of Mockingjay, which is the conversation between Peta and Gail. I've talked about this before, but the power that the three of them would have been as a team. Gail is the brains, Peta is the poet, Katniss is the leader. But I really like the conversation between them. Peta says, that was funny what Tiger said about no one knowing what to do with her. Well, we never have, Gail says. They both laugh. It's so strange to hear them talking like this, almost like friends, which they're not, never have been. Although they're not exactly enemies, which is again the text reminding us that like we don't need teams. I mean romantic teams I guess is different than like enemies, but like they're not enemies. Then they're about to all split up and go out into the crowd and Peter's like I'm gonna go out there and I'll just have to take my chances if you know, I'm captured. And it says, the two exchange a long look and then Gail reaches into his breast pocket. He places his Nightlock tablet in Peta's hand. I just like how he just is like, yeah, I'll give you mine. And the fact that they shared a long look makes me think there was like some kind of discussion there. I would like to see it, Suzanne. I would like to see it. And then Gail says, BT showed me how to detonate my explosive arrows by hand. If that fails, I've got my knife and I'll have Katniss, Gail says with a smile. She won't give them the satisfaction of taking me alive. And it's foreshadowing because she does let them take him alive. Which is actually the next part I have tabbed to talk about. Gail gets captured by peacekeepers. He's mouthing something. Katniss is like, what? And then it's too late. So he's like, bitch, go. And it says, I fall into a doorway, tears stinging my eyes. Shoot me. That's what he was mouthing. I was supposed to shoot him. That was my job. That was our unspoken promise, all of us, to one another. And I didn't do it. And now the Capitol will kill him or torture him or hijack him or the cracks begin opening inside me threatening to break me into pieces i'm emo about it am i glad that she didn't shoot him though so that he lived yes and then once again suzanne collins with her death scenes the writing so good because for just a moment she catches sight of me her lips form my name and that's when the rest of the parachutes go off. And where was Gail when these were going off? Captured by peacekeepers. Keep that in mind. And it's talking about how the bombs like kind of like got her on fire. And she says, when one caught me, ran its tongue up the back of my body. And it just made me think of her being on fire in the first games and how it all came full circle-ish. There's a lot of full circles in this book. 
a lot of them. Then let's just quote President Snow talking about the bombing, shall we? However, I must concede it was a masterful move on Coin's part. The idea that I was bombing our own helpless children instantly snapped whatever frail allegiance my people still felt to me. There was no real resistance after that. And then Katniss is the one to think of Gale and BT's brainchild bomb thing. But like, he wasn't the one that dropped it. He just thought of the idea. Because like I said earlier in this vlog, he is constantly thinking like his enemy, which is the only way to beat them. And again, it goes on the topic of war, but I'm not gonna get started on that. And then we get Katniss kind of realizing why Coin would do what she did. I recall Bog's response when I admitted I hadn't put much thought into Snow's successor. If your immediate answer isn't Coin, then you're a threat. You're the face of the rebellion. You may have more influence than any other single person. Outwardly, the most you've ever done is tolerated her. Suddenly I'm thinking of Prim, who is not yet 14, not yet old enough to be granted the title of soldier, but somehow working on the front lines. How did such a thing happen? Did Coin do it hoping that losing Prim would push me completely over the edge? or at least firmly on her side. You might be like, why are you being so defensive that Gail didn't kill Prim? But it's because that's the number one thing people say when I'm like, I love Gail. They're like, you killed Prim. I'm like, do you know how to fucking read? We see Effie again very briefly. And here's my unpopular opinion. I like that. I like that Effie wasn't really in Mockingjay, and I don't like that they increased her role in the movie. I hate, I loathe the idea of Hamish and Effie as a couple. I don't like it. It doesn't make sense at all when you think about Hamish as a person. It was just weird. Like, I understand the movies did it because Effie became a character that everyone recognized and liked. And Elizabeth Banks just did a really good job portraying her. I don't think they should have done that because it just, it ruined the whole message. It just, it, I don't like it. I don't like it. <sighs> and then we get our last scene between Katniss and Gail. She's in her monologuing saying, Gail comes up behind me and we examine each other's reflection. I'm searching for something to hang on to. Some sign of the girl and boy who met by chance in the woods five years ago and became inseparable. I'm wondering what would have happened to them if the Hunger Games had not reaped the girl. If she would have fallen in love with the boy, married him even. And sometime in the future, when the brothers and sisters had been raised up, escaped with him into the woods and left 12 behind forever. My voice is about to crack. I'm so sad. And then she just straight up asks, him was it your mom and he replies i don't know neither does bt does it matter you'll always be thinking about it and that just shows that like as hurt as both of them are in the situation because katniss even says that she can't not think about it like that and that she'll just have to deal with the pain he like understands and he doesn't try to push himself on her he literally leaves and is like i'll let you go off and live your life katniss because i don't want to hurt you and that just shows his character. Y'all can say what you want, but Gail is a stand-up king. I also don't accept that the last thing he said to her is shoot straight, okay? Because the epilogue didn't say it, but they end up reconnecting, at least as friends. I'm not saying that she would like cheat on Peter or anything. But there's there's just no way that they never speak again. False. Then they have that victor's meeting to be like, should we have another Hunger Games? And something interesting I find is that Joanna is very bloodlusty, but we don't hate on her for it, which I don't think we should. Like I understand her pain and where she's coming from, but we don't allow that same understanding <clears throat> for other characters that have also suffered a lot in their lives. And I just find that interesting. So Katniss kills Coin, and then she tries to have her nightlock pill, but Peter's like, no, they're taking her. And she says, I start screaming for Gail. I can't find him in the throng, but he will know what I want. A good clean shot to end it all. And I'm just like, even after they had their like, goodbye, she's still thinking of Gail. And then just the whole part of her like thinking about suicide is just so sad. Like the war is over, they won, and it's still crushing this book. And at one point she says, days pass, weeks. I watch the snows fall on the ledge outside my window. And in all that time, mine is the only voice I hear. Which is so messed up. Like why wouldn't someone be trying to help her? Like I put like a hate tab on that. Cause I'm just like, that. that's not healthy. And then I underlined this because it was good social commentary and also a mood. I no longer feel any allegiance to these monsters called human beings. I think that PETA was onto something about us destroying one another and letting some decent species take over. Because something is significantly wrong with a creature that sacrifices its children's lives to settle its differences. Then we have the circling back to what Tigra said, which is the truth is no one quite knows what to do with me now that the war's over. And then we have Plutarch saying something very profound and then something so human and silly, like ridiculous at the same time. Katniss says, are you preparing for another war, Plutarch? Oh, not now. Now we're in the sweet period where everyone agrees that our recent horrors should never be repeated. But collective thinking is usually short-lived. We're fickle, stupid beings with poor memories and a great gift for self-destruction. And then in the next paragraph it says, and then he asked me if I'd like to perform on a new singing program 
program he's launching in a few weeks. Literally, I don't even have the words to like comment on that in a social commentary way. And we find out Katniss's mother isn't coming back to 12, and I said, sis learned nothing. Then we have a part I like that Peta does, which is she finds him outside her house, and she's like, oh, you're back. He's like, yeah, woohoo. She says, what are you doing? And he says, I went to the woods this morning and dug these up for her. And he's planting primroses, which is really sweet. Although potentially triggering, but sweet. So then I get my last update on Gail. She's talking to Greasy Say and she says, where did Gail go? District 2. Got some fancy job there. I see him now and again on the television. He got some fancy job. He's gonna make the country so much better. I love him. Then Katniss in her monologues. I dig around inside myself trying to register anger, hatred, longing. I find only relief. So the way I read that quote is that she's not angry at him. She's not longing for him, but like that can be disproved in the next page. So hold on. And she's relieved because he's like found himself in District 2. He's okay, he's got a nice job, he's living his life. Which means she doesn't blame him for Prim's death and she's not mad at him, so y'all can shut the fuck up. Then we get confirmation that Madge died, which I put a hate tab on because what's the point? <laughs> what's the point? She's another character that I just pretend didn't die, but went to District 2 with Gail and they're living happily ever after. Then she's in the woods. She goes to the place where her and Gail would sit and meet. It says, I sit on the rock where Cressida filmed us, but it's too wide without his body beside me. Several times I close my eyes and count to 10, thinking that when I open them, he will have materialized without a sound as he so often did. I have to remind myself that Gail's in two with a fancy job probably kissing another pair of lips. Probably not, I think he's still hurting. But like, you're gonna tell me there's no longing, but you're gonna sit on this rock and be like, is Gail here? Sis, sis. And we have one of the most heartbreaking scenes where Katniss finds that Buttercup somehow made his way to District 12 and she's just yelling at him that Prim is dead. So that part's really sad, but then we get a really sweet part. But he must understand, he must know that the unthinkable has happened and to survive will require previously unthinkable acts. Because hours later, when I come to in my bed, he's there in the moonlight, crouched beside me, yellow eyes alert, guarding me from the night. And there's actually a quote earlier in the book that kind of foreshadowed this or like, hinted at it. Katniss and Prim are in their room. I have to get back to the hospital, Prim says, placing Buttercup on the bed beside me. You two keep each other company, okay? Buttercup springs off the bed and follows her to the door, complaining loudly when he's left behind. We're about as much company for each other as dirt. Except. And then we get that quote that I think is dumb because of who I am. She says that what I need to survive is not Gale's fire, kindled with rage and hatred. I have plenty of fire myself. What I need is the dandelion in the spring, the bright yellow that means rebirth instead of destruction. The promise that life can go on no matter how bad our loss is, that it can be good again, and only PETA can give me that. Like, that's fine, I guess, but I feel like Gale would not have rage anymore because he used it in the war and it's over. But that's on that's on that. And then we get the epilogue, which is where I put my most hate tabs because I hate it. We get this lovely quote. It took five, 10, 15 years for me to agree, but Peta wanted them so badly. When I first felt her stirring inside of me, I was consumed with a terror that felt as old as life itself. Only the joy of holding her in my arms could tame it. Carrying him was a little easier, but not much. Does that sound like Katniss wanted these children to you? Put aside how much you love Katniss and Peta together. Put aside that you want them to have a cute little family. Does that quote make you think Katniss wanted this? Because what I read is that Peta wanted them so badly. And for years and years and years, he wanted them. And so finally Katniss was like, I guess we can have kids. I would be fine with them having children if it was written differently, but it literally reads like Peta was nagging her to have children and then finally she gave in. That's my opinion. I know a lot of you will disagree, but I just think it should have been like, it, there should have been something about her wanting them because it's not there. Then we get my children who don't know they play on a graveyard. Peta says it will be okay. We have each other in the book. We can make them understand in a way that will make them braver. But one day I'll have to explain about my nightmares, why they came, why they won't ever really go away. I'll tell them how I survive it. I'll tell them that on bad mornings, it feels impossible to take pleasure in anything because I'm afraid it could be taken away. That's when I make a list in my head of every act of goodness I've seen someone do. It's like a game, repetitive, even a little tedious after more than 20 years, but there are much worse games to play. Okay, the end line is iconic, best ending line that I've probably ever read in a book, but it just doesn't end with much hope. There's a little sprinkled in, but you finish the book and you're not really feeling like hopeful, good about the world, all of that. And that's what you kind of need after finishing this because it's so torturous and so many horrible things happen. But I just finished and I feel like I was wrecked. Miley Cyrus was on that ball. She came right through me. And I don't know, I just feel like, I feel like there should have been a little 
something happier. But that's the end. That's the end of Mockingjay. Something I also realized while reading this was that the things I hate about it weren't so much little moments that I could put a tab on, but rather just bigger things like coin being evil and District 13 basically being just all about power. Like, I don't like the idea that these rebels were somehow bad and there was just, I don't know. I know war is bleak. I know humans are shitty, but there's just something about this ending that I think could have been better. It was wrapped up very quickly at the end. Katniss is just in a room, locked away while there's a trial. So much of the book was like done well and described and all that stuff. And then the end is just this rushy kind of mess. And I just didn't love it, but I liked it more than I did the last time. So that's something. If you stuck through this, thank you so much for watching. My camera's about to die because I don't shut up. I will see you guys in my next video. And my next vlog will be me reading the new book, which I'm terrified of because President Snow. Finishing this does not make me want to read about President Snow, but alas. Bye!